Well, we're going to start a brand new series today, and I, I feel like this is the, this is the time, uh, and I've really felt directed by the Lord to, to do this series as we're heading into uh, the election season, and this is just really a, an important topic for us as a church, and it's time uh, it's time to take a take a temperature reading, I believe, of the church, and uh, I believe this series is going to help us with this. It's going to answer a lot of questions that people have. Um, a lot of people have questions about things when it comes to God, but they're too embarrassed to ask. So I'm going to answer questions, assuming that they're questions that a lot of people in the room have. And we're going to answer those questions over the next few weeks. And this is why I think it's really, really important, because it's going to end up being a blessing to you. How many of you guys believe that once you have answers to things, you can make good decisions? Yeah. Right? It's hard to make good decisions when you've got lots of questions. But when you get answers for those questions, you can then make good, good decisions. So that's the whole goal of this series. So why don't we start with a word of prayer. The, uh, this part one of, of this series is entitled, Why Pray? Why Pray? So let's bow our heads. Let's invite the presence of the Lord into this time. This is what it's all about. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you that you have brought us here. It's not a coincidence, God, but it's been ordained by your hand that we would be here in this place, in this moment, in this time. And so, Father, I know that you desire to, to, to speak to everyone here. And so, Holy Spirit, we, we welcome you. We invite you. We, uh, we open ourselves to you. And, God, we say, go ahead. Go ahead and speak to us. Show us whatever it is that you want to show us. Answer whatever questions we might have today. God, we just thank you for this opportunity that you would want to speak to us. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that everyone would leave here today having had a real and true encounter with you and, and your love. In Jesus' amazing name, amen. 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 So, uh, today we start this, this four-part series on prayer. I want to encourage you to invite people uh, to come to church for the next few weeks because we're going to really cover some things that I think are really really important. I think when we're done with this series, um, I think everyone is going to be more equipped and everyone's going to be more motivated to pray. And, and when that happens, you're going to see God move in your lives in ways that you've never seen before. And that's the whole, that's the whole point. All right, so let's get into this. First of all, here's a statistic for you to think about. 46% of American adults are unchurched, meaning almost half of American adults don't go to church. But yet, 81% of that percentage say they're Christian. So half the adults in America don't go to church, yet almost all of them say, in spite of that, that they're Christian. That same percentage of adults say that they pray, but they also admit that they struggle with knowing how to pray, and they also struggle with knowing who to pray to. You see, we have a problem. When asked about their prayer lives, many people just kind of shrug their shoulders and say stuff like, I don't know, I, th I, think, I think I have a pretty good prayer life. For, for, for many people, even in the church, even people that go to church, and of course, this huge group of people who don't go to church but yet say they're Christians and say that they pray. For many of them, prayer isn't something that they're super excited about. 
And yet, at the same time, they don't totally reject it. They're somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle. So, when it comes to prayer, there's a massive amount of people that are neither hot or cold. They're what the Bible calls lukewarm. They're in the middle. And that's not by accident. Because many people believe that it's best to be in the middle. They feel like being in the middle is the safest place to be. And right now, everything is all about safety. You want to be safe, be in the middle. Don't be first. Don't be up front. It's dangerous to be up front. It's dangerous to be a trailblazer, to be, to be, you know, to be conspicuous up front. But at the same time, don't be last either. Either way, you get a lot of attention, right? If you're first, you get a lot of attention, positive and negative. When you're last, it's mostly negative, right? But you still get a lot of attention. So the safest place is to be in the middle. But Jesus said that the middle is the worst possible place you could be. So contrarian, isn't it? Jesus said it's the worst place you could be. In Revelation, the book of Revelation, basically, I'm paraphrasing, he said, do anything but be in the middle. Do anything but be in the middle. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. And I want you to look at... uh, This is a message that Jesus gives to a particular church, a church in the city of Laodicea. Bear with me, and you can read along with me on the the screen. This is a fairly big passage I want you guys to see. And then we're going to get into, we're going to look at this passage, and I'm going to show you how this pertains to prayer. Because remember, the title of today is Why? Why Pray? So, starts in verse 14. It says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write. So this is a message. And you'll see this is a message from Jesus to a particular church. This church in the city of Laodicea. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write. These are the words of the Amen. Notice Amen is capitalized. Jesus is the Amen. He is the first and the last. He is the Alpha and the Omega. These are all names for Jesus. He is, these are the words of the Amen. And he, the faithful and true witness. Okay? Another description of Jesus the ruler of God's creation. Okay? Now, think about this. You got a message that starts off like that. You'd pay attention, wouldn't you? It's like, uh oh. <laughs> I hope the rest of it is good. <laughs> but it's not. He says, I know your deeds. In other words, I've been watching you. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Woo. Suddenly, the middle doesn't feel so safe. So because you are 
lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church, to the churches. Wow. We could spend weeks on that passage. There's so much that he says to that church and what he's saying to all churches today. Jesus gave that message as a warning. He said, correct what's going on before it's too late. He gave it this as a warning. But within this message, I believe he reveals the primary reason that Jesus expects us to pray. Jesus expects you to pray. He has an expectation. But I also believe in this passage, he reveals the primary reason why we struggle with drifting towards the middle. Because that's how many Christians live their lives. They drift to the middle. You know, the middle is a place where, you know, maybe you don't do anything terribly wrong, but you also don't do anything very significant for the Lord either. You know, I heard a, a, a story. It may be true. I don't know. But evidently, a long time ago in uh, one little Midwestern town, there was a lady by the name of Nancy Jones, and she held the distinction of being the oldest living resident in this little town back in the Midwest. And so when she died, this is years ago, the editor of the local paper, he wanted to print an article about her and um, remembering her, uh, but he couldn't think of anything to write. And so, because she had never done anything bad, you know, she had never been arrested or spent the night in jail or, you know, uh, you know done anything terrible, but at the same time, she never really did anything significant either. So he didn't know what to write. So with this in mind, he goes to the cafe, and he's having lunch, and he runs into the funeral director, and they're having a talk. And the funeral director is having the same problem because he wants to write something on her tombstone, but he doesn't know what to write. She hasn't done anything bad, but she, never, she hasn't done anything really significant either. So... The editor goes back to the office and he decides, you know what, I'm going to give this assignment to the first uh, uh, editor of the paper that I see, the first staff member, I'm going to give it to them and pass this on. So he gets back to the office, he runs into the sports writer, the sports editor. He gives, gives him the assignment. And so 
His assignment is to write an article, but also whatever is in the article is going to be on the tombstone of Nancy Jones. So somewhere in a little town in the Midwest, there's a tombstone that reads, Here lie the bones of Nancy Jones. For her life held no terrors. She lived an old maid, she died an old maid. No hits, no runs, no errors. <laughs> and that's how a lot of people live their lives. No hits, no runs, no errors. So, we have a problem, and the problem is revealed in that passage in Revelation chapter 3. Because remember, I said that in, within this passage, Jesus reveals not only um, this issue of drifting towards the middle, but, but the primary reason that we struggle with drifting towards the middle. And that problem, our problem, is pride and self-sufficiency. Pride and self-sufficiency. If you haven't figured it out already, pride is a killer. Pride is a killer. I heard, I heard I read an amazing story uh, that something true, this is actually true, that happened during the Civil War. Um, It was during the Battle of the Wilderness, and uh, Union General John Sedgwick, he came to, he had uh, set up a a fortress, and he wanted to inspect the troops. And so he inspects the troops, and and he came upon a parapet, which which is a, a a wall where that to 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 protect everyone, but there was a place where you could you could stand up over the wall. He's standing up over the wall, and he's looking at the enemy, which is in the distance. And his officers said, hey, um, that's, that's not wise for you to stand there. Uh, that's, a, that's very dangerous for you to stand there. And General Cedric turns around, and he snaps at his junior officers. He says, nonsense. They couldn't hit an elephant at this dis... (laughs) And you know what happened, right? That's exactly what happened. Pride is a killer. It's a killer. Pride, self-sufficiency, See, the thing about pride is that pride blinds us from being able to see reality. It it blinds us from seeing reality. Jesus said in that passage in Revelation chapter 3, he said that the people of that church in Laodicea were blind. They thought they were doing great. but they were blinded to reality because of their pride. In reality, they weren't doing great. In reality, they were far away from God. And likewise, pride can blind us from seeing reality, from living in reality. The reality, especially, that we need God. Even when things are going good for you, even when things are going awesome for you, you need God. You need God. Uh, There was a a, a really wise Bible teacher. He said, sooner or later, God will bring self-sufficient people to the place where they have no resource but him. Anybody ever been there? Sooner or later, 
God will bring self-sufficient people to the place where they have no resource but him, no strength, no answers, nothing but God. And without God's help, they know they're sunk. He then told a, a story of a, of a man who was really in despair, and he meets with his pastor, and uh, he's really struggling. He says, man, my life is in really bad shape. And the pastor says, well, how bad? And the man starts crying. He buries his head in his hands. He says, I'll tell you how bad. This is how bad it is. All I've got left is God. Of course, the pastor's face lit up. He goes, hey, man, <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that. Because if you've got, if that's all you have left, you have more than enough for victory. You've got all you need for victory. In Revelation 3, 17, Jesus said to them, you say you're rich. I have acquired, you say I'm rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. Pride, self-sufficiency. It can sneak in lots of ways in our lives. It may not, it may or may not be about money. It could be that we focus on our independence. I do what I want. I can choose, I can do whatever I want. I can be whatever, whatever I want. It could be that our focus is on our rights. I have the right to, for this. I have the right for that. It could be that we use our schedules, our calendars to control our lives, our relationships. Has anyone ever said this? Think about this. You don't have to raise your hand. The only thing I need is more time. You don't have to raise your hand. I see the smile on your face. You're just like, <laughs> yes, me. The only thing I need, I've got everything I need, but the only thing I need is more time. I don't need more of God. I don't need more wisdom. I don't need more character. I just need more control of my schedule. Pride, self-sufficiency. And Jesus' answer to us in that place is, but you do not realize you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. The reality is that we need God all the time. So, he goes on to say in verse 20, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Now, this scripture, for, for many of us in the room are familiar with this, uh, it's often used to lead people to Christ. And that's, a, that's, that's true, this is true. Jesus is always standing at the door of your heart. Waiting for you to open that door and allow him to come into your life. That's how salvation starts. That's how we start our relationship with Jesus. Is that we open the door. We receive him. Jesus doesn't barge into your life. Jesus will never make you do something that you don't want to do. He's very polite. 
He's not, you know, like when you're in college and you've got, you've got roommates and you live in a dorm and people just barge into your room without knocking, like, whoa, man, what are you doing? You know, G- that's not Jesus. He will, all, he will politely stand outside the door of your life. Whenever you're ready, And the, to me, the most powerful word of this verse, the most powerful word is the word anyone. Because it doesn't matter how good you are or you think you are or how bad you think you are. It doesn't matter about your past. It doesn't matter what people say about you doesn't matter how many enemies you have or how many people think you're, you're the best thing ever. You still fall in the category of anyone. Open the door. Now, notice that it doesn't say if someone else opens the door for you. Your mom can't open the door for you. Your dad can't open the door for you. Your grandparents, your kids, your grandkids, your friends, your pastor, your priest. No one can open the door for you but you. But Jesus said, if you will open that door, I will come in. So we use this to um, we use this verse a lot of times to help people understand and how to come to a, a saving faith. You know, I was thinking about this before I get into the rest of this. I was thinking about how life is all about choices. Life is all about choices. And I think everyone in the room understands that. I mean, we drill this into our kids. Life is about choices. Coaches drill this into their players. Teachers drill this into their students. We we understand this. Life is about choices. But, Maybe you haven't thought about this. Eternal life is also about choices. The same principle. The same principle that applies in this life applies in eternal life. Where you will spend eternity is up to you. It depends on your choice. There's no, uh, you, you know, there's no free, there's no pass. There's no, people talk about God, how would a God, you know, send people to hell? God doesn't send anyone to hell. People send themselves to hell because they choose that. Because eternal life is based on choices, just like choices are, are based on this life. So, but the interesting thing about this verse in Revelation 3.20, when Jesus says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I will come in. He's not talking to unsaved people. Remember, the letter is to a church. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. He's speaking to the church. The wording here tells us, and in the Greek, it's in the, it's in the present, um, it, it, it's, it's speaking of, continu- of a continual action. The wording is that Jesus is 
always standing at the door of our lives waiting for us to open the door. This is all day, every day, every moment. It's constantly standing outside the door of your heart waiting for you to open it. It never stops. He never stops. What an amazing thing. It's always standing outside the door. And the implication is, is that he doesn't want to be outside. He doesn't want to be outside. Ever lost your key and, and, and locked yourself out of your house and you're standing there going, I can't believe this is my house. I'm standing out here. It's raining. I you know? Jesus is outside. He's standing outside of the door of our hearts, always knocking, always wanting to come in. So, I think you can put two and two together. How does this apply to prayer. Why pray? Well, the answer is that prayer opens the door. If Jesus is constantly, continually, I mean, you see the picture, right? Even at this very moment, Jesus is outside the door of your heart because it, the language is that he's continually outside the door of your heart, continually wanting to connect, continually wanting to come in. Why pray? Because when you pray, you open the door and allow him to come into your life and into your circumstances. If you're a Christian, then Jesus assumes that you know this. He assumes that you know this. And so he assumes that you're going to pray because prayer is the way to involve God in your life. That's why. That's why we pray. We pray to involve God in our life. That's what Jesus meant in John 15, 5, when he said, I am the vine, you are the branches, which is what Luann sang during worship. I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, that's speaking of cont continuous action, right? Uh -huh. If you remain in me and I in you, I'm not outside, I'm inside. Right. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. As long as he's outside, you aren't going to accomplish anything for God. But if you want to do something significant for God with your life, he needs to be inside. Because when you involve him in your life, your life produces fruit. I started off by bragging on my wife. My wife is incredibly successful. She's led thousands of people to the Lord all around the world. Why? Because God is inside and he ain't outside. Amen. Prayer involves God in your life. Now, This is also a great temperature check, heat check. How much you pray reveals 
how much you depend on God. If you don't pray, that means you don't need God. You might say you do, but in reality, you don't because you don't pray. Bro, (laughs) we all ought to be praying 24-7. If you think you don't need God, good luck. But how much you pray reveals how much you depend on God. Praying is the opposite of pride and self-sufficiency. Prayer is humbling because it comes from a heart of, God, I need you. I depend on you. I need your help. I need your wisdom. I need your direction. I need your protection. So, wanting God to be involved in your life is not a lukewarm thing. It's not a casual thing. Yeah, you know, every now and then, I, I need a little bit of God. I mean, think about it. As a believer, I have access to God. Why would I be casual about that? (laughs) Why would I be casual about Well, I mean, I I do have the phone number for the creator of the universe. (laughs) I use it every now and then. (laughs) When I realize how much I need God and that he wants to be involved in area area of my life, my family. God wants to be my constant companion. When I realize that, man, I want to pray. I want to be in church. I want to pray with my brothers and sisters. I want to be in prayer meetings. I want everything that God wants for me. I want to hear everything he wants to tell me. I don't want to miss anything. I want to close with this. I've told this story before. It's such such a powerful picture. Back in the 18 late 1800s, there was a little boy and he lived in a real small town and um he was about 12 years old and and he had never been to the circus, and, and news spread around town that the circus was coming to town. And he was super excited. He saw a poster up on, in town and ran home and told his parents, you know, the, the circus is coming to town. I really want to go. And um, His family was poor, but the dad sensed how important this was. And so he says, okay, son, if you do your ch- chores early on Saturday... I'll give you the money, and you can go. So Saturday comes. He, little boy, he gets up early, does his chores. Dad gives him a dollar, and he runs, uh, you, know, r- you know, runs all the way into town and to the outskirts of town, and people are already gathering, to, uh, lining the street on both sides to see the circus parade as they come into town, and then they get set up and then they do the show so the little boy gets there and he works his way up to the very front and he's in perfect position and soon they could hear the sound of the parade coming and it was the biggest most amazing thing this kid has ever seen before I mean you know the bands are playing and marching by him and the the caged animals are snarling as they go past him and all the performers and everything and at the very end there was the the circus clown you know with his big floppy shoes and the ears and the face paint he's bringing up the rear and as he passes by the little boy he's 12 years old he reaches into his pocket and pulls out his dollar runs into the street and hands his dollar to the clown and then he runs home What just happened?
that little boy thought he saw the circus. But he just saw the parade. He missed the circus. The thing that he wanted so badly to see, he missed it. Are you experiencing all that God has for you? Are you in the middle, just kind of going through the motions? Part of the parade, checking out the parade, but missing the actual thing. Settling for second best. That's where the middle is. You settle. You could be doing something really significant, something powerful, something adventurous, something dangerous. But we're in the middle. I pray a little bit. You know, I'm sure it's enough. Wanting God to be involved in your life isn't a casual, lukewarm thing. So, I hope I've answered the question. Why pray? Why pray? Because prayer is the way we involve God in our lives. If you want God to be involved, then you have to pray. Will you bow your heads? I'm going to have the the worship team come up in just just a moment. But with every head bowed, I want to ask, because this is a time, this is the time in our service for us to to respond to what God is speaking. Remember, Jesus is standing at the door of your heart, knocking, wanting to come in. And this is an opportunity. Every time we come together on Sunday morning, It's an opportunity for us to open the door and allow God to come in to receive whatever it is that he wants to say to us. So with all with all of us, with our with our our heads bowed, our eyes closed, this is the time for us to respond to him. We're not to just be hearers only, as the Bible says but we're supposed to be doers of the word. There's action involved on our part. There's choices involved on our part. So I want to ask if you're here today, and first of all, if you've not made the first choice to open your heart and allow Jesus to come in to your life, For him to become the Lord and Savior of your life. To ensure, to make the choice to spend eternity with him. Just like life is all about choices, eternal life is all about choices. And it's all about opening the door and allowing Jesus to come in. And allowing him to be the Lord of your life. For him to be the one that drives your decisions. So if you're here today and you haven't done that, I want to give you that opportunity today. It's the most important decision you can make. It it involves eternity, where you spend eternity. So if you're here and if you haven't made that decision, or if you're not sure and you you want to make sure that you make that choice, I want to give you that opportunity 
today, and if that's you, would you just lift your hand right now because I want to lead you in a simple prayer that will dedicate your life or, or rededicate your life. Amen. Amen. So church, I want, I want all of us to pray, pray this out loud along with those that have raised their hands. Say, Dear God, I come to you and I admit my need for you. I let go of my pride and my self-sufficiency and I open my heart to you, Jesus. I know that you are the way. I know that you are the truth. And I know that you are the life and eternal life is in your hands. So come into my heart, come into my life and lead me. I ask for your blessing in Jesus name. Amen. With every head bowed. In Revelation 3, we saw that Jesus, the way that he, the answer to their pride and self-sufficiency was that he told them to repent. He told them to, to start doing what they, doing the right things. And so, maybe you're, maybe you've been in that place of you've allowed pride and self-sufficiency to cause you to drift towards the middle. Maybe you've been in that place. Maybe you're at that place where you've been dependent on yourself more than you've been dependent on God. And your prayer life is a reflection of that. But that, but that you want that to change. Now you understand why why you should pray. And so if that's you, and if you're, if you're ready to, to, to change that in your life, you're ready to admit your dependence on God and, to, and for your prayer life to really be ignited, if that's you, lift your hand right now as well and take this time to profess that to the Lord to let the Lord know that that's what you want. Father, I just want to lift up everyone that has raised their hands, all those that are, that are making that decision right now, all those that are coming to you, that are opening their hearts, Lord, that are responding to your knocking on their lives and their, the heart, their hearts, God. Father, I pray that you will, you will come in and that, God, that you will ignite you will ignite a passion and excitement for prayer like, like they've never experienced before. I pray, Lord, that there would be prayer warriors that will be raised up based on this what, what they've heard today. I pray, Father God, that, that instead of uh, drifting towards the middle, Lord, that, that there would be people in this room right now that would, that would move towards the front, that would become leaders when it comes to this area of prayer. And so, God, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for what you're doing in the lives of your people and in our church, God. I pray that as a church, we would be on fire for you as we pray, as we seek you, God. And I ask you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good start. I want to encourage all of you that are watching to continue to give faithfully to Celebration Church. There's so many different ways that you can do that. Of course, you can mail mail uh, mail it in or drop by our location, which is 990 Meadowgate Road in Meta Vista, uh, California, 95722. You can give online a couple of different ways. You, know, you can always use PayPal. And use the PayPal address of one celebration at sbcglobal.net or you can go to our 
our website, our church website, which is www.ccfellowship.org. Go to the home page, go up to the About Us uh, tab, pull that down and go to the to Give Now, and then there's a Donate button that'll take you to our online giving page. And uh, text giving is available as well. That's our, it's probably the fastest way to give to our church. And that is, you text the word give, text the word give to area code 530-288-4500. And you can uh, give your tithe and offering uh, to, to celebration that way as well. And uh, always, if you're watching on our YouTube channel at Celebration Church Office, subscribe and click like. We're so glad you decided to join us today. We hope you were blessed and encouraged. If you gave your life to Christ or want to reach out to us in any way, please email us at celebrationchurch13 at gmail.com. To purchase Lou Ann Lee worship CDs and songbooks, click the links below. God bless you.